Okay, I guess he's got the mic turned on so I can walk up here and say welcome to our evening service here at North Baptist Church. We're glad you're here tonight. Let's start our service by turning to hymn number 47, Fairest Lord Jesus. Please stand with me if you would. Fairest Lord Jesus. Good evening, folks. Good to see you all. As we go to the Lord in prayer, let us especially remember Carrie. Carrie Wiley. No, Carrie Madsen. Sorry. (laughs) She goes in tomorrow at 7 o'clock. And Lord willing, we'll have a new member. Let's be sure and remember her in prayer, that everything will be fine for the baby and the mother, that the baby will come in safe into the world, all right? It is good to be back. You know, there's no place like home. You can travel, you can enjoy things. I told Susan earlier this afternoon, I said, sweetheart, I said, you've missed your calling. You could have been a truck driver with me. She did help me a little bit on driving. I had to have some relief at times. And um, she did pretty good. And I thought, you know, you're, you weren't a bad co-driver. So I said, you know, maybe you missed your calling. And of course then she gives me the look, which I mean, no, she didn't agree with that. <laughs> Well, we might have some others traveling coming up uh, this week, so let's be sure and remember them in prayer. I think other than a lot of wind and some trees and stuff down, there was a lot of wind, there's a lot of rain. There was flooding there on the the coast, of course, where my son and law and daughter live. They got a lot of rain, but that's about it. So we're glad for that. And then I hear that after this week, next week, it's going to be cooler. And I'm looking forward to that. 
But the best thing is to look forward to the great things the Lord has to open to us tonight, the days ahead from his word. So let's ask God's blessings on us tonight and ask his presence with us. Good to see Brother Tom here tonight. Brother Tom, would you mind leading us in prayer? Good afternoon again and welcome back to North Baptist Church. If there are any first time visitors, if you'd fill out uh, the uh, card in front of you and drop in the offering plate as it passes in just a little while. A couple announcements. First one, if you're a Lions fan, you're still of no hope. They're still not any good. I'm sorry about that. Um, it's just unfortunate. Also, but if you're a deer hunter, a couple weeks, opening day, so you got that looked forward to. So, a couple things coming up. But the important news is the Flint Crisis Pregnancy Center Banquet uh, or fundraiser is coming up here pretty soon as well, just a couple of weeks from now. Uh, that'll be October the 4th, and if you have any questions on whether you want to attend, donate, or help out in any way, uh, please see Mrs. Susan Burkholder or Mrs. Jennifer Wiley, and they would love to get you set up with that. Uh, the other thing is, as we've been saying, is our missionary cards. They're out in the foyer um, in a little basket. If you'd like to take one with a ring, and each month we will add a new missionary. The, this month's missionary is Stephen Martha Anderson. Um, if you received a bulletin this morning or picked one up tonight, there should be a little sheet in there as well that gives a couple prayer requests about them and also their next stops on their journey, if you will. So if you'd like to pick one of those up, they're out there, and keep them with you as a reminder to pray for all of our missionaries, not just those, but all of them that we have. Um, that's all I have. Uh, Dick? Okay, for our next hymn, we're going to turn to uh, page number 18, Glorify Thy Name. I'll let you remain seated for this one. So... missionaries uh, letters from our, 
our missionaries, especially the ones that have retired. And this is from Mary Lee Cummings, one of our retired missionaries. With this summer ending and fall rushing upon us already, I need to catch up with you a bit. As I am so often reminded of God's great faithfulness to me, I'm also reminded of your faithfulness to me with your monthly support and availability for prayer needs. Thanks from my heart to you who continue to remember me even between my letters. This June, I celebrate, celebrated my 89th birthday along with my granddaughter Lindsay's 26th birthday. This is an exciting year for us as she will have her first baby in October, giving me my first great grandchild. She continues to write her books from her home office, now on her ninth book, to be published and has been named twice in the past year on the New York Times bestseller list for recent books. It's a blessing to live within a few minutes of my son Don and wife Karen. Don directs the Department of Prosthetics at Scottish Rites Children's Hospital in Dallas, and Karen teaches special education life skills class at a high school. They're both very busy, but we get together when we can. Rick lives in Phoenix, Arizona, and in July was able to spend uh, a week here before continuing on with Don and Karen to our annual vacation on Anna Marie Island. So we had some good times together during a brief visit. He's 62 now, and after a recent heart attack, had his sixth stent put in. So along with anemia, his health is not good, but he trusts the Lord for daily strength to do what he can. With Rick living in Arizona and Kathy and Stan in New Mexico, we don't see each other as often as I'd like. Kathy's husband works as a nurse in a senior living facility. We communicate by phone and emails. Kathy is not well and can't travel far with her very painful back problems and asthma. All the smoke from the fires in western states uh, have affected her very much. Well, this is mostly a family report, but it's still a big part of my life these days. I still play piano for a small church on Sundays and a group of residents in this village that just like to sing for fun once a week. We sing hymns often and other popular, old popular music they enjoy. I still direct a prayer group at 9 a.m. on Mondays and enjoy attending two very good Bible studies each week. The Tuesday a.m. group is going to study Genesis all this coming year, starting next week at my church. It would encourage me if your, your friends would, would pray for me to use my strength and time to follow the Lord's leading and serve others in my building in these late years of my life. Psalm 92 promises that in old age we will flourish like a palm tree and will still bear fruit proclaiming, the Lord is upright, he is my rock. With much gratitude and thanks to each of you for blessing me with your friendship for so many years, that's Mary Lee Cummings. Men, if you wanna come forward. Recently, uh, another retired, one of our retired missionaries, Ruth Jordan, uh, went to be with the Lord this past September. So if you remember, Ruth's family, I appreciate it. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for this day. Thank you for this past week and the blessings you bestowed upon us. Thank you for safety for Pastor and Susan as they travel, Father. I pray that you will uh, be with all our missionaries, Father. We thank of the remains who will be traveling uh, to the United States here and uh, this coming week, Father, from Spain, give them safety. I pray that you'll continue being with Mary Lee Cummings. Uh, she's been so faithful to you down through the years and still uh, serving you, Father, in the capacities that you've been able to, to uh, give to her. And, Father, I pray that you'll be with Ruth Jordan's family in a special way. Just comfort them as only you can. Again, Father, I thank you for this day. Be with pastor as he breaks forth the word. I pray, Father, you'll encourage us, edify us and equip us to be better uh, witnesses for you in our community. Now I take, pray that you'll take this offering, Father, and bless it. I pray it'll be used to bring honor and glory to your name. For it's your name we pray, amen.
Thank you, Carolee. Okay, before the pastor comes to speak tonight, let's stand and sing number 170, Oh, How He Loves You and Me. take your Bibles and turn to the book of Philippians chapter number three. <coughs> I, uh, I hope that um, tonight there will be some things challenging to you. How, how many have ever been in a track and field event? Uh, quite a few, quite a few. Bob, were you ever in any sports? Lunch? <laughs> well, how about football? Anybody play football? I did some football. I came to the point when I became a senior in high school, I could go half a day to school and then I can go work and make money. I thought I'd rather make money than get my body beat. Well, anyway, have you ever done something and you've set a goal to reach and you fell short of it? Did you feel defeated? Did you feel like a failure? Did you feel like, well, why should I have even tried? Now, sometimes when we think like that, we think that it's just expected if I'm going to do this, I'm going to give it my best. Then I'm going to win. But we know, of course, that there's only one winner, you know. I like to watch track and field events because they're, it's so competitive. I know that football, basketball, baseball, soccer, and all these other things, I know that they are too equally as competitive. I know hockey is. Why you want to put a club in the hand of a bunch of guys to beat the tar out of each other, I don't understand. It's hard to understand hockey, but some of you that grew up in there and grew up with hockey, you, you see the thrill of it. I remember years ago that we went to a hockey game over in North Carolina, and then we did down in there in South Carolina, and uh, my daughter, my sweet, tender daughter, she said, oh, I like to go just see him fight. <laughs> I mean, one night, that guy I'm about stripped all of his gear off. He was down to nothing. His shirt was ripped off. I mean, there was quite a fight, quite a brawl. Well, anyway, people are competitive. People like to win. I like to win. I remember something Vince Lombardi said. Now, since I was a little kid, I was a Green Bay Packer fan. And I liked the Dallas Cowboys when Tom Landry was there, because Tom Landry was a good Christian. He had a great testimony. And so I liked him. But I, I liked Green Bay Packers, and I liked it from some of the players that were on the team at that time. 
I still remember watching on TV the Ice Bowl, they call it, between Dallas and Green Bay. And, of course, Green Bay won quite a, quite a game. I remember something Vince Lombardi said. He said uh, uh, that winning is everything. Well, it is. It is true. Winning is. That's, that's right. There is something more to be said than just winning. I remember one coach challenging us in high school football. He said, show me a good loser and I'll show you a loser. Well, he's really right if you think about it. Now, obviously, he didn't mean being unsportsmanlike. He didn't talk about unsportsmanlike conduct. But he just was remarking about, about guys that they don't like losing, and they're going to give their all to win. And you have to give your all. One challenge we had one year in football at the beginning of the season there in high school was a kind of a pep talk by a coach. And he said, you know, he said every year, I'll always have some boys come back to me and say, you know, coach, I could have done a little bit better. I could have done a little bit more. He said, why not this year? Let's let this year be different. And you give it your all. And then when you come back after you graduate, you say, coach, I gave it my all. I gave it my best. You know, those kind of emotional appeals are good. They're helpful. They're challenging. And you might say that here in Philippians chapter 3, that Paul was essentially trying to exhort the believers in the same way. Because it's important for us, if we want to live, like we said this morning, above the level of mediocrity. Do do you want something more than just a mediocre, average, superficial Christian life? Now, we can do that. You've been saved by grace. Praise the Lord. Coast. Go ahead and coast. See, there's, there's no risk at all in putting yourself out. You just, just keep safe. But I tell you what, you're going to lose out on the prize when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. And last Sunday night, I talked to you about what is the attitude, basically of a winner, but the attitude that a church member should have. Two things are essential that we want to consider whenever we look at this passage here tonight. It is equally imperative, first of all, that you develop the right attitude. You've got to develop the right approach and perspective and viewpoint. And number two, you have got to strive, you've got to strain after the goal. And what is that goal? Well, Paul tells us it's being transformed into Christ's likeness, being Christ-like. Look here in chapter 3, verse 10. Now, actually what he does, he lays out a fourfold process by which this takes place. Verse 10, he says that I may know him. Let me say this again, but let me say it different. Look at the phrase, I'm going to read it, but it's going to sound different. That I may love him as I should. Do you think that fits? Sure it fits. Do you guys remember the first time that your wife caught your eye? Or wives, when you became interested in your husband? And you thought, boy, listen, I hope he comes and talks to me. I hope he asks me out. Something caught your attention. Boy, I, I'd like to get to know her. Now, Susan had learned and heard of some things about me. And she cared nothing to know me or have anything to do with me. Sad, isn't it? Well, what she heard was that the year before she came to school, she transferred from Florida up there to the college where we were going in Missouri. And she had heard things. Well, the year before, I did. I got into trouble. 
And you say, good grief, how can you get in trouble at a Bible college? Well, it can happen. It can happen. You say, well, in your case, how did it happen? Well, it simply happened because I let my life become influenced by other characters that I don't think shared the same zeal about wanting to serve the Lord. Now, it's not their fault. That's my fault. But I let that influence me. I let the bigger, bitter, negative, criticizing spirit get a hold of me. And then, of course, I didn't quite like how God was doing some things and in my life. And I thought, you know, this is ridiculous. Well, I got into trouble. Now, you could only be allowed 75 demerits per semester. Well, by the second semester, <laughs> um, I had 73. So you could say I was skating on thin ice. So, well... We went during the spring break, and some guys and I, we went and did something that we shouldn't have. Well, my buddy, two other buddies and my, we, we figured we'll just keep our mouth shut. Nobody will know. The fourth guy, he got worried, and so he went and tattled. And we had to turn ourselves in. So the school suggested that you, you take some time off. So all they did was give me demerits. Well, they gave me 75 demerits. Well, I already had 73, so I was out. I had to sit out a while, and then I had to return. But during that time, as I struggled with some things, and I had to struggle with my life, just exactly what was I there for? I called my dad. Now, my dad was a godly man. He was a godly dick, and his dad, my grandfather, was a preacher. So I called him. I told him, I said, well, I've, I've been kicked out. That was what it was like on the other end of the phone. <laughs> he didn't say a word. Then he broke the silence and he says, well, you might as well. He said, yeah, go ahead and leave. You might as well. He says, you don't care to be there. Why, you don't, you don't care about lost souls, do you? You don't care about the fact that you were called, felt called into the ministry, and you're there to learn to serve. So it's a bother to you, go ahead and leave. So he didn't have to say much, but, you know, I felt just about this small. I felt deflated. And I realized it wasn't so much that I ran short of the goal of my father or of my pastor or of my friends or family or the school. I was disappointing two people. I first of all disappointed the Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't realize that because of my mediocrity and my superficial living as a Christian, learning to minister the word, I, it never once dawned on me, it should have, how foolish I was, it never once dawned on me that I was deeply grieving the heart of the Lord. The Lord wasn't pleased with that, but I threw caution to the wind, so what? I didn't care. Now, there were some other guys that got into trouble, and of course, you know what? They, they quit, they left. Well, I determined I was going to come back, and if for no other reason, I was going to at least show everybody I could finish what I started, and then I'm going to go on my own merry way. But, you know, in that interim time, the Lord got a hold of my heart. And he began to work on me. And so my viewpoint changed. My attitude changed. You see, nothing could change unless I was willing to let my attitude change. If we're going to be a healthy church and have healthy ministry, if you are going to be a healthy Christian, then you've got to determine what kind of a church member am I going to be. And where it can start is I've got to take evaluation of my attitude. And I've got to find out, well, just how do I treat the things of God? So when I read this, remember, 
Look back at verse 10. You're looking at that I may know him, but here's what I'm reading. That I may learn to love him more and more. Well, this goes back to what I asked you guys about when your wife first struck your attention in your eye. Now, Susan didn't want much to do with me, but something had changed. And so my sister-in-law, my oldest brother's wife, her and Susan were good friends. I think there was collusion here. They were in cahoots with one another, but they were good close friends. And she said, oh, Hal is different. He's changed. Susan gives the look and says, I got to see this to believe it. Did you notice the difference, dear? Okay, good. I didn't want to go on with the story unless I knew for sure she, she did. So I began to flirt with her and stuff. And there was this young little boy on campus. He, he was. He, bless his heart, he, he was. He had some mental issues. Uh, everybody liked to watch him come to the dining hall because he carried on quite a conversation with himself. His name was Marvin. And so I told Susan, I'm going to fix you up on a date with Marvin. Well, I was just teasing. and So finally, going outside the steps there of the dining hall there on campus, I was standing on top. She had descended the steps, and I called out, got her attention. She turned around. It was in the fall of the year. Uh, the leaves were changing. It was kind of breezy. Leaves blowing. She had this nice sweater jacket with a hood and she had the hood pulled over to protect her hair and she turned around and I looked at her and I knew and this is the truth I knew right then I'm going to marry her and so I asked her out and I'm telling you folks they had to come she just melted Didn't you, Susan? <laughs> well, if you know Susan and I by now, you know. But she did accept. And so we, we went on dates and we went on more. So we met up at the snack shop one night, or one afternoon. I was getting ready to go to work. You see, I, I worked. I worked full time, putting myself through school. Um, her folks were paying her way through, and... She was a 4.0 student. Susan was top honors. She was elected into who's who of American college and university students. I, at the same year, I got elected into who, who's who, who cares? <laughs> I was envious of that. I was envious of that. But yet at the same time that as we kind of dated, I began to really fall in love with her more and more. And I told her at snack shop. We hadn't been dating but what, just a few weeks? And I told her, I said, this is the real thing. Now, I'm here for the long haul, and I'm here to marry you. Now, if you don't agree, this is your time to hop off. Well, she said, uh, you know, I'd kind of like to get to know you a little better. Good, but you on or off, period. Well, I think she was, but she has a point. You know, I want to get to know you. A little better. Do you know that after 41 years, we're still getting to know each other? Now you say, well, that's kind of strange. Well, not really. There has been something developed through the years that's made me crave her and want to know her more and more. Now, I'm not talking about knowing about her. She's five foot two. She, she was a beautiful brunette. She still is. Let me rephrase that. A little gray in there. She was. She is smart. She was 4.0 in high school. She was elected into the who's who of American high school students. Go figure. She's so sharp. She's fat. I cannot stand to play games with her, so I cheat so I can get an edge. 
we were playing, it was, it's like tic-tac-toe, only it's a three-dimensional score four. And she kept beating, whooping me in that, and I didn't like that. She is very competitive. If Susan had any vice and was out in the world, she'd be there at the casinos. She's very competitive. She knows what it was, but she's sharp. She's a quick thinker. Me, I, I'm not dumb. I just, I just mull things over. I'm a little slower. I approach it different. I think on things. I meditate on things. She, she's quick. So I knew that there was a good balance for me. I need that. She, she's an angel. I've told you before. She is. And so there were things that just made me want to know her more and more. Now, if you said, do you know Susan Master? I would say, yeah. You know, she was friends with my brother and his wife, knew them well, worked with them in the youth department where my brother was youth director at her church in Florida. See, that's one way. That's one level. Then you say, do you know Susan? Yeah, I could say, I know a lot about her. I know that she's studying to be a school teacher. I know things about her family. See, I can go on and on about Susan. Now, those things are important and they're in their place. Okay, folks? But when we talk about really knowing them, we're not talking about knowing about them, see? We're talking about knowing them in an intimate personal experiential way and the only way I can do that is I've got to be with her I've got to spend time with her and you learn pretty quick what she likes and doesn't like and we had just gotten engaged Thanksgiving day wasn't it we were in McDaniel's McDaniel's Park, weren't we? We were in the park. Never mind what we were doing. We were in the park. So I asked her to marry me. And she said yes. She said, well, we girls had a bet going on in the girls' dorm about when you would ask. If you would do it on Thanksgiving Day so that you wouldn't forget when you had asked me to marry you. <laughs> Susan, I said, how could you? But it does help to know. <laughs> that was a wonderful experience. And it wasn't long after we got engaged, you know, we had our real first argument. Okay, so is there something wrong? No. Let me ask you guys something. Do you, do you know the Lord is Savior? Do you or don't you? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I'll raise my hand to that. Amen. Amen. Okay, do you know everything about the Lord? Of course not. Do you understand all the things that God tries to do? Do you understand the multitude of ways that he works? His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. How, how can we grasp that and comprehend that? But you tell me tonight, if I were to ask you, and you were to be honest, you love the Lord. Would you say that tonight? Yes, I love the Lord. But do you love him as you should? Now, to love him as you should, it's I've got to know him. That's why when we look at this passage here tonight, that I may know him. Paul is talking about making a choice that he is going to yield. He was choosing to accept the mind and will of God as his very own. He's going to think like God. He's going to act like God. He wants to behave like God. He wants to be Christ-like. He is making a conscious free will choice to choose to have the kind of mind and thinking of Jesus. He's going to have that mind. He's going to think just like that. Listen, we have got to think together, Susan and I. You and your spouse have got to do the same thing. Or if you want to put it on the scale of your children. You see, 
you, you guys, you young guys raising your kids, we that have raised our kids, we know good and well, it takes a lot more than just playing with your kids and spending time with them. Now, that is important, isn't it? Sure it is. You know it is. There's a lot to going into raising your kids. One of the opportunities as we were working in the church in North Carolina and I contracted freight, sometimes I would take one of the kids with me. Sometimes a couple or three of them with me. Sometimes I'd take one at a time and spend the time. And I remember the one time I had the boys with me. Keith kept asking me questions about salvation. And I knew that there was a point Keith was going to get saved. And he did one time in Sunday school. I remember Josh. Now Josh, Josh was a cut up. He got in trouble because he was too sociable. He was a clown. He was funny. Do you know he wanted to be, his goal in life was to be a Christian comedian. We thought, Lord, help us. So all we could do is encourage him and pray, Lord, you've got to get, well, the Lord did get a hold of his heart and called him into the ministry, but now he's in a ministry, in a camp ministry, where he utilizes those gifts and skills he has as being funny, doing skits and planning things for the kids, and the kids just eat it up. They love it. He's a nut. But he's doing good. I thought, well, at least he's channeling that in the right direction. But one day, Josh was standing outside the church. It was Wednesday night after church. Susan was talking with some other ladies. Other people were milling around talking. And I had put something out in the car. I was walking back up to the front door of the church. And Josh was there with his Bible under his arm. And he just looked worried. He looked sick. He looked like something was not right. I said, hey, what's the matter, buddy? He said, Dad? And I can tell he was about to burst out crying. He said, I don't think I'm saved. You know, it's important that a father is sensitive to the needs of his children, that a mother is sensitive to the needs of her children. Isn't that important? And the only way that you can is you've got to get to know them. And Paul, that means there's got to be an attitude of yieldedness. You've, you've got to want to be like Jesus. You have got to want him. I want to... Keith would mimic me lots of times. When he'd be around the church, they're helping me. So would Josh. And I realized how important a role I play in their lives. Same way with Jenny. Jenny and I bonded specially because she's my only little girl. You know, those things are important and spe special. They're precious. They're precious. This is what Paul is talking about when he says that I may know him. He says, listen, that I may fall in love more and more with him. We could say that, that I may learn to love him as I should. I always loved Susan. I always did. But I've had to learn her. I've had to learn how to love her as I should. Because you see, in the early years, there, there was a lot of self involved there. There can be with a couple. Sometimes it's that same thing that's present in the love between you and your kids. Sometimes we discipline more or less how it's going to make us look. And so sometimes it takes a while to develop the skills necessary to be in the kind of parent. But being the kind of parent your kids need means I, I'm going to, first of all, I want to know them. I want to understand their interests, their character, their nature, their, the uniqueness of their personality. This is what you make a conscious choice to choose to have God's mind and his will rule over your life. And then it's learning to love him with all of your heart. He says, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy strength, with all that is within you. Love him more and more. Love him most. But it also means to get fully acquainted. 
I want to become more thoroughly acquainted with him. I want, I want to understand the remarkable wonders of his person, of his work. I won't understand it all, but I want to know it. I want to strive after that. See, this is what he's talking about. I want to understand things about this salvation that he has provided for me. I want to understand exactly what is involved in the character of God. What is Christ's character that is so important that I can use it and adopt it that may help my behavior, my actions, my motives? So for the last 40 years, I've been falling in love again and again with Susan. And she's been falling in love again and again with me. I, I, I can't take it. I mean, where's it going to go? It just gets better. That, that's what Paul knows or what he means to say, what he's trying to get across. That I may know him. He said, listen, this, I want to relate this to you folks. Here's my purpose. Here's what it means. Here's the result of getting to know the Lord, having his righteousness. This is my goal. I want to know him in such a way that I can learn to fully relate to the Lord. When you first come to know the Lord, there's going to be a multitude of things you just don't know and understand. There were a multitude of things I didn't know about her. But I couldn't. I had to experience marriage. I have to experience the day-to-day, -day, the ups and the downs. I had to go through that. I had to go, she had to go through and experience, sometimes, disappointments. She had to experience the times when she'd like to strangle me. I fully understand. But you see, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You don't want to keep that up. You don't want to make that kind of a routine, a pattern. But sometimes, even you guys, when you're, she thinks different. How is it that women think the way they think? I don't know. I do believe women are from Venus and men are from Mars. You say, well, uh, well, some of you, we've been married almost 41 years. Listen, some of you, a lot longer. Well, how'd you do it? Well, I tell you what, you, you couldn't have done it without knowing more and more. And sometimes, the, know you, the more you know about a person, the more of their cracks and flaws and shortcomings you're going to see. Now, obviously, with the Lord, that's different. Okay, it's different with the Lord because he has no flaws or anything. He has no shortcomings. Now, sometimes to us from our perspective, it seems as if he does because we don't understand. Paul says, listen, I'm willing to afford that. I'm willing to go through that. I'm willing to go with the struggles of what it is to make a marriage work. I'm willing to go through the struggles to see that my relationship with Christ works. And so it's going to take me learning and willing to be acquainted more with him, to be yielded. And Lord, could you show me how to love you more and more? So when we look at that phrase, that I may know him, that I may learn to love you more and more, Lord. That I can love you as you deserve to be loved. I want to to love Susan as she deserves to be loved. I want to be worthy of her affections. And it takes a while to develop it, but that's what Paul's talking about. That's a lifelong process, but that's a key part of the process to know him. Now, you know, last Sunday morning, we talked about dying to self. 
Well, that's the fourth part here in this verse he talks about. And we, discovered, we talked about that first. Why? Because none of these others can fall into place unless I learn to die to self. You know, I've got to deny self. Okay, here's, a, here's, a, here's an illustration. I'm sitting there in my easy chair. I'm watching the news or I'm reading the paper or I'm doing a puzzle or I'm reading a book. I'm just enjoying myself and Susan, she's off doing something. Susan has got to be doing something all the time. Susan, can't you just sit down and relax and do nothing? Yeah, so she sits down and then she's busy doing something. I thought, Susan, you're ADD or ADHD or something. She's not, but I tease her about it. But she's off in the other house. She said, Al, yes, dear. Would you do something for me? Sure. Uh, what? <laughs> now, see, I don't want to get up out of my chair. And she'll ask me to do something. Now, right there, I have a choice. Whether I can gripe, I can complain, or I can, yes, dear, I, I, I'm glad to do it. Am I always glad to do it? Well, no, because right there, there's that struggle. There is the struggle between, in our ego, between self and dying to self. And so I can't really say I want to learn to love her more unless I come to the point that I first, I'm willing to die daily, as Paul said in Galatians 2.20. I die daily. I've got to die to my wants, to my wishes, to my will. I've got to learn to deny myself. Listen, every morning you guys do that. You go to work. Oh, Bill, here on third shift. Boy, do you have to die to yourself to go to leave the comforts of home and work a third shift. It's tough, isn't it? But you, you do it. Whatever motivates him, he does. You see, we can't really learn to talk about, to know him, to love him as he deserves to be loved unless we're willing to put self aside. I cannot appreciate her or show her and assure her that I do appreciate her unless I die to self and I'm willing to get bolted out of my comfort zone and leave my com the comfort of my chair and do what she wants done. I, I've got to learn to do that. I have to do that. I have to die daily. So do you. Because Jesus Christ may ask you to do some things. He may ask you and place upon you a kind of burden or responsibility that you may feel like you're not able to handle. But the good thing is, his power is there. He says that I may know him, I want to experience him, and then I want to experience the power, his power and enabling of what? His resurrection. Listen to this. He said, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Oh, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin want to live any longer in it? Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, we were baptized into his death? That, like as Christ, in the very same way, like Christ, was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. That means by the power of God. From the human side, looking at Jesus on his human side, did he have anything in his body while he was in that tomb to give him the power to be raised? No, not if we look at it from the fleshly, the human side. So what gave him the power to be risen to new life? The power of God. And that same power is what is alive and working in us. Paul said, I want to experience that. I, I want to know that. You know, I want our marriage to end well. I want my relationship with Christ to be different. Is your relationship with Christ different? How about with your kids? You know, again, there, there's a real challenge. 
I, I, how, how do I get to know them? Okay. Well, first of all, I've got to spend time with them. If you want to learn to love the Lord more and know him more, you're going to have to spend time with him. That's all there is to it. A lot of time. Time in his word. Time praying and talking to him. But you know, I also can learn to love my kids and my wife by encouraging them. Exhorting them. Yeah, I could push them a little, but encouraging them. You know, that's what God does. That even sometimes when I do fail, you know, we talked about this goal. We talked about reaching goals. And sometimes we don't always hit the mark, but it's better you strive for that than to do nothing. And so you encourage him. I encourage That's how you can do it. But you know how else I can learn to love my kids? Well, I try to cooperate with their maturity and their interests and who their nature is, their personality. You know, I'll, I'll never understand anybody that gets caught up with all of this Star Wars stuff. But some guys are really into it. My, you know, my, my boy's kind of like that, you know. And Jenny, bless her heart, she, she was a bookworm. She didn't care about sports. She was content to lay on the couch or on her bed and read her life away. She read a lot of books. You know what she read? She read these uh, drippy mushy, syrupy romance novels. I'm talking about some good Christian romance. Jeanette Oakey writes some good ones. It wasn't worldly trash or anything, but that she was a romantic. You know, and Susan would suggest, I think we need to get this for them for Christmas or that. And I said, what on earth are you? I don't want to buy them that. Yeah, but she said, but that's what they like. You see, I've got to, okay, what are their interests? I need to cooperate with that. Well, that's the same thing there. What are God's interests? What would he have of me? Then I need to get connected to those interests and think I want those interests to be mine. You see? And you know, as, as, as a parent, I've got to establish boundaries. And my kids won't like it. And I'm going to learn a little bit more about them and how they respond to that. Well, that's the same thing with the Lord. God sometimes has to draw some lines in our life. And we don't like it sometimes. And we certainly don't like it when the preacher preaches on something and it really kicks us in the gut. That's hard. Do you know how else I can learn to, to, to love my kids more? Give them responsibility. And say, I'm going to expect this. I'm going to exact this out of you. You cross me, and you're going to pay the consequences. But I also gave them responsibility. They weren't going to lay around and sit around and do nothing. They learned to do housework from a very early age. And I didn't give them an allowance. They did what they were told to do. Someone, Josh asked me, well, he says, well, how, what is this? What is going on here? Okay, just a minute. Why do we have to do it? I said, because I said so. Why is that? I said, because I'm the dad. Kids don't need a reason. to. Do, they need to do it because they were told to do it. They don't always have to have a reason. But we gave them responsibility. Well, that's what God does. Sometimes he asks some things of us, and we're going to get to know him more as we obey we obey. That's the key by obeying. Do you understand that? See? And then you know how else you can learn to love God more and to know him better? Just like with your kids. With my kids, I learned to develop two-way communication. I told them the what for is this is the way it goes in our house. But you know, I learned to develop this two-way communication by letting them I let them have a say. Every once in a while, we'd sit down at the dining room table and have family round table. And I said, okay, you, got, you guys are welcome to speak out. Well, we didn't like this or that or whatever it is. And we would work it out the same way with the Lord. 
But I also had to develop this communication. I needed to talk with them more. I just didn't want to grunt at them. That's what a lot of fathers and mothers do. That's why kids are like they are and they're starved for that. There was a little boy that didn't have any of that when Susan taught third grade up there in North Carolina in Thomasville. He was a holy terror. He was terrible. And Susan was hard on him. Not that she, because she was mean. She set boundaries and he had to obey or else. And he didn't like it. Well, he was a little black boy. Came from a hard situation. And one day, he had to stay after, I think, this day, wasn't it? I think he went up to you and hugged you. And he said, I wish I could go home with you be with your family told Susan I wish we could have brought him now I would have warmed his backside if he didn't listen and obey and that's what he had to learn but see that's what he wanted he wanted to know that someone cared and established boundary and developed two way communication that's the way it is with the Lord the Lord doesn't constantly criticize you he doesn't do that if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraids not. He doesn't tease you and taunt you. He doesn't criticize you and rail on you and say, you're stupid, you should have known that. No, he does not do that. When you need it, he says, I'm there and I give it liberally. You know how else I could learn to know my kids and my wife more? I expressed my love. There's not a day that goes by that I don't tell her I love her. There ought not be a day go by that you fail to tell the Lord that you love him. Remember a prayer of a man, one of the deacons of a church, I don't know where, but as they were praying, he stopped in his prayer and he said, Lord, I love you and I just wanted you to know. But you express your love not just in your words, but in your life, in your actions. You know how else I can help to know my kids more? As I always made sure of their salvation and their spiritual growth. And that's what the Lord does. And when you have that bonding, you get to know the Lord. As you grow and mature in the Lord, that's what develops. That I may know Him. Now I'm going to tell you this right now. I wouldn't trade Susan for anything in this world. Isn't that good? <laughs> of course not. Well, that's, that's kind of a given, isn't it? But now I have got to work. I worked to gain her and win her. I won her over. Now I had to constantly work to keep that strong. To show her that I don't take her for granted. And that's what you have to do. Listen, is that the kind of church member you want to do? Do you want to be one that wants to know the Lord? That, if you do it on that level, as I've explained tonight, that will take you above the level of mediocrity. That's going to transform you into Christ likeness. That's going to do something to you. But you're going to have to want to change your attitude and your outlook. You're going to have to want to do it. Now, did we have problems and situations when we got married? Yes, I remember we got a little house we rented not far from the school. I had finished school and I was just working. She had one semester left of student teaching. We had that little house across from that uh, auto park store. It's a little, actually, a one-bedroom house. It was a house that was built back in the 1800s, and the guy fixed it up, kept it up, rented it out. So we were renting it there. We were happy. And I don't remember what the problem was. <laughs> I don't know what we were arguing about. Something foolish, I'm sure. Well, I got mad. She stormed off one way. I went to the front door, and I went out the door, and I banged it behind me. 
Now our car was sitting out in the driveway close to the sidewalk and the curb and so we always brought it up closer beside the house and so I went out there to do that. Do you know what went through my mind? You remember this, Sue? Wow. I started that car up and I thought, I bet she thinks I'm going to take off. But all I did was pull it up to the house, away from the street. Now you see, I was, I was a little wicked there, I, a little. Boy, that was just terrible. I knew what I was doing. So I came back in, and there she was crying. I went over to her, and I said, you think I was leaving? She said, yes. So I said, well, honey, let's talk. I took her into my arms. I don't know what the argument was, but I made right. Making up can be hard to do sometimes, I know, but boy, it's nice. It's nice to be in good terms. I don't know what happened after that. I guess we're okay. We didn't kill each other, right? <laughs> See, that's, that's part of to know him, that sometimes God sends you through some, some rough channels to see how you're going to tread water, but he's developing, he's tempering your spirit. And one time when I was a teenager, the same thing happened with my dad. I can't remember what the argument was about. I was in high school, senior high school. And I mean, the words got strong. Finally, I'd had it and I stormed off and my dad stormed off. I was in my bedroom getting ready to go to bed, so I walked back through the house to go to the restroom before I went to bed, and I noticed out of the corner of my eye, he was still there kind of pacing back and forth in the living room. Went to the bathroom, started working. He called me, said, Hal, come here. He said, son, I love you too much to let anything come between us. And I want you to know, I'm sorry, I want to make right. I apologize, I was wrong. Well, by then I thought, no, Dad. I don't know what the argument was about. It didn't matter who was right or not, but I said, no, I was wrong. I didn't hold the respect for you as I should have. I was wrong. And Dad said, well, let's get down and pray. You see, that's the key. My dad was not going to let anything come between he and me in our relationship. I was determined nothing's going to come between Susan and me. And that's the way you've got to be. That you're determined that you will not let anything come between you and your relationship with the Lord. Would you stand with me? Dick, what are we singing? Page 524, brother? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Is it 524? That's a good song. Let's end with that. Let's end with that song. Let me challenge you tonight. Let me challenge you tonight, please, to take these things, ponder them, and determine that you're going to know him and the power of his resurrection. Dick, lead us in this. Seek ye first, page 524. Oh
dismiss us, brother. Dear Lord, thank you for this time today, for the privilege of freely assembling together to uh, worship.